Welcome to Blaco session three on rainwater reclamation. In session one, we talked about sizing and feasibility. In session two, we talked about the treatment system, rainwater, stormwater, and combination systems, and the level of contamination which can be found in these different waters. What we're going to talk about in session three is looking at a couple of real world examples and applying the techniques and treatment systems that we learned in session two to a few real life cases. We're also going to look at kind of an in-depth sizing uh, analysis of one of these systems to kind of highlight how you, how you utilize a lot of the sizing techniques from session one. It's kind of a refresher. When looking at a rain or storm water system, there are four different requirements which are utilized to determine the perceived level of contamination which can be found in these systems. Geography, where the system is located. Catchment surface elevation, where there's storm water where it's on the ground, first floor, all the way up to 30th floor, which again has a direct impact on the amount of water and the contamination of the water. What is near the catchment surface, industry, agriculture, metropolitan, and then the materials of construction of the roof, which have an impact on the metal contamination in the water. Looking at our first situation here, an elementary school in northern Alabama, the Appalachian Mountain region, wants to install a rainwater reclaim system for flushing fixtures. The school is a single level and is located near a rural forest area with overhanging trees. This is kind of the classic example you would see if you were an MMP or mechanical plumbing engineer working on a school kind of project. There's a lot of different things in this, in this, in this which are going to dictate how we're going to design our system. So looking at our four requirements, again, geography, we're in the southeastern U.S. Our rainfall is going to be fairly basic. We're going to have fairly consistent rainfall of four, four inches of rainfall on average. This is a mountainous region. It's a very, it's a foresty region. There's going to be a fair amount of wildlife in this area. And we are looking at a first floor building. So we have a fairly low catchment surface in this case. We also have some overhanging trees, most likely, which are going to overhang onto our first floor building. So looking at both what's kind of immediately around the area and also my catchment surface elevation, I'm going to see a higher than average biologics buildup in this system. I'm also going to see a slightly higher than normal particulate buildup, again, just due to that lower elevation. I don't know the material of construction of, in this case, um, but looking at the fact that we're in the southeast, we don't have a lot of acid rain involved in this case. We probably don't have the metal leaching issues that you would typically see if, say, this was located in New York, as opposed to being located down in Alabama. So looking at this system, it's purely for flushing fixtures, first floor building. We're going to look at this as, and it's looking at a first floor building as school, we're probably looking at a fairly small usage. We're probably looking at four or five different lavatories, relatively low water use. So in this case, it's going to be a direct storage style system. We're going to need cistern, first flush, and treatment devices in this case. We're going to have a first floor building. We're going to have a lot of contamination from that building. We want to take a lot of that out before it hits my catchment surface, uh, before it hits my cistern tank. From there, for flushing fixtures, we're going to use more or less a standard system. We're going to look at particulate filtration and then sanitization. There's no special reasoning for different waters in this case. You don't have a very high load. It really is just removing whatever that roof contamination is in that case. So this is a fairly simple problem to look at that you're going to see in a lot of smaller commercial or academic buildings for rainwater treatments. Kind of moving it up in difficulty here a little bit. A five-story building on a college campus near Allentown, PA wants to install a rainwater reclaim system to supplement water for a greenhouse located on the roof. The roof itself is a green roof. The greenhouse will utilize misters to distribute the water within the greenhouse. So what's going on in this case? Well, let's look at where we are. We're in Pennsylvania. We're in the mid-Atlantic north, northeastern region. So we are going to see some acid rain in this case. Allentown, for those of you who don't know, is actually an old steel milling town, although there's not a lot of industry there today. 
So you're not gonna see a lot of industry play. You will see some acid rain. We know the composition of our roof is a green roof. A green roof, for those who, those who don't know, is essentially a roof that has plants planted on it. It's gonna act itself like an irrigated area. Green roofs in general are not good for reclaimed water systems for really two reasons. One, the green roof itself eliminates a lot of the water that could be captured for your system. It's going to be utilizing it's, it's going to be utilized for irrigating the plants on the roof. So your roof catchment surface is going to be decreased. You also are now introducing essentially ground level contaminants onto your roof. So you're going to see a much higher level of particulate matter in this case, which could be transferred into your system. So the green roof itself, not the most ideal situation for a rainwater reclaim system. What else do we know about this problem? We're irrigating with the water. We're irrigating into a greenhouse. We're irrigating it from misting through a greenhouse. Greenhouses in general are not irrigating on the ground level. Greenhouses are gonna be targeting specific plants, specific mineral content in those plants. We're not gonna have those minerals in our water. Our rainwater is gonna be very clean, it's gonna hit the ground, it's gonna have some pickup of some turbidity, some biologics, but it's not gonna have the same kind of content that you would see if you were irrigating, see a lawn outside. If you're irrigating specifically a plants or other vegetation, you're gonna probably need to add mineral content back into your, back into your rainwater. You are also going through a mister. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with misting or fog machines, they essentially use very, very finely filtered water and they use like a corona or other spark to basically shoot it out as a mist, which means we need to get this down to a very, very low particulate level or we're gonna risk clogging the system in this case. So, it's a little bit more going on in this case. We have the green roof situation to deal with. We're five floors above, the, we're five stories above the ground, so we're not gonna see a ton of you know, leaves or things like that. Just what we're going to see from the green roof in this case. We do need to temper our water to some degree for use and we need to make sure we heavily filter it or we wish clogging the, the devices within the greenhouse. So in this case, and we know that we also have acidic rainfall in this case. So in this particular situation, we're going to try to use again roof pretreatment, which in this case would probably be a little bit larger than we did in the last case. We're gonna to wanna to remove any of that runoff, that dirt runoff from our green roof in that case before it enters our, our, our actual direct storage tank. We're gonna pressurize it. We're gonna to need to filter this down and we're gonna to need to go very low. We're gonna to need to go to like 10 micron or one micron in this case. We're gonna to need to use some kind of redundancy in our filters. We're also gonna be utilizing this water for greenhouse which means we're going to, and this water is going to be fairly acidic and it's going to have very low mineral content associated with it. We're going to want to pH adjust this water and we're probably going to want to actually add calcium into it, which can kind of be done sort of in sort of the same way in this case. And the calcium we're going to do is going to add in the, it's going to, going to add in mineral content so that our own rainwater that we're using doesn't actually leach it out of the, pl out of the plants in the greenhouse or out of the soil for the plants in the greenhouse and as a standard, we're gonna use disinfection in this case. So a little bit going on in this case, but this is kinda of how you have to look at your system and then design it. One, based on what your incoming water is, but two, also what I'm using it for. In this case, if it was a standard irrigation problem, as in, the, as in you know, some other cases, I wouldn't really care about the pH adjustment, I wouldn't really care about the mineral content so much because it's gonna get, get shot out or dripped into an open lawn, you're gonna have all of that mineral content, all that ground dirt there to neutralize and then also to add minerals back into that water in that case. A residential high rise in New York City wants to use a stormwater runoff from the parking garage to supplement its cooling tower demand. The top of the garage is open to the atmosphere and the ground level cannot be used due to the gravity flow height limitations. Well, this is a stormwater treatment system. We're taking water off a parking garage. Even though it is not a ground level, parking garage would be, would be characterized in this case as a stormwater system. 
The fact that the garage is open to the atmosphere doesn't really have any effect on us. It's kind of a miscellaneous fact. And the fact that the bottom can't be used is probably beneficial to us in that case. That's going to be the ground. That's going to be the ground level of the system. Being that this is a stormwater application, we have to look at it a little bit differently. We have to look at what else is going to be added to this. What we're going to have oils. We're going to have antifreeze. We're going to have a lot of particulate matter. We're going to have a lot higher biologics matter going into this case. So we have to treat the stormwater very differently. We're also going to be using this in a cooling tower. Cooling towers ideally want to utilize low conductivity or low TDS, total dissolved solid water. Reclaim water from a parking garage is not a good application for this in a lot of ways. From a feasibility standpoint, this is not your ideal scenario because you're going to add in all additional contamination, put it into your cooling tower, and it's going to cause the blowdown very quickly. So we need to really treat this water also not just beyond what contamination is in it, but to actually make it usable in our given case. So in this case, we're not going to use any kind of obviously roof treatment. We're going to go right into a parking garage setup. We're going to have oil removal. We're going to have oil emulsion separation in this case. This is going to take the place of any real catchment surface treatment at that point. We're going to remove the oils, any freezes, large particulate matter, cups, straws, um, Food, food debris, what have you, right out of our water before it hits the actual system. We're going to add emulsion to help to, to mitigate any kind of actual dissolved or emulsified oils in those cases. This is also going to be an ideal case to utilize a cistern storage design because my treatment system from my cistern to my use is going to be fairly intense in this case. So I'm going to want to go into my tank pump through very slowly, and then cooling tower kind of drip into it as necessary. Because as you can think about, we've moved a lot of the heavy, back, heavy particulates, but we still have to get this water, one, disinfected, and two, usable in a cooling tower setup. So at this point, we're going to go between our cistern tank and our clean water storage tank. We're going to repressurize the water. We're going to need to use filtration in this case. Um, to knock this down to 50 to 10 micron, and then we're going to have to go through a membrane-style filter in this case. The membrane itself will then allow us to remove a lot of that additional contamination, which you're going to see from the groundwater. You're going to see probably see discoloration. For example, somebody spills soda in your tank, it's going to discolor it. All these kind of variables, all the snow melt off. This is in New York City, so I'm going to see a lot of ice. I'm going to see a lot of de-icer use, salts. All that cannot be used in the cooling tower. That's going to have to be removed using, in this case, probably a low energy reverse osmosis device. So you're really going to pre-treat and then use your RO to really do 95% of your cleanup in this case. And when you're done with that, you're going to have water, which is actually going to be better than city water to help supplement your cooling tower. But you want to keep that as small as possible. You know, if you're running into your cooling tower 50 or 100 gallons a minute, as a very instantaneous flow rate, you want to make this as small as possible. All these equipment, like for example, like membranes, can get very large at very high flow rates. So then from there, you're going to use your cistern design, flow into your clean water storage tank, and then pressurize to your point of use in this case. So as you can see, this is why stormwater or getting the combination can get a bit more complicated. And this is, you really have to do an analysis on this to look at how much water you're really getting to see if this is justified. Because this is going to be capital equipment cost compared to the previous two systems, a lot more expensive in those cases. So you really have to look at how much bang you're really going to get for your buck in these cases. In the last example, a large corporate campus wants to use storm runoff from its multiple acre grounds, which includes parking lots as well as, as well as a local artificial pond for cooling tower and flushing fixtures in two new buildings it's constructing on campus. All right, what's going on in this problem? This problem is a little bit more involved. You have, a, again, this is a stormwater application. But you're also utilizing now an outside water tank for use this artificial pond that they now have on this, on, this, on this campus. So looking at your stormwater, you're going to have parking lots, you're going to have grassy areas. This would be a fairly complicated system to size. 
because you're gonna have to look at very different sections of it and also look at how much of this can you actually run to your natural pond. In the actual system we're discussing here, they're basically taking their storm drainage right to their actual pond and they were basically using that and then they were just kind of using it and letting it overflow in that case to the actual storm systems. The artificial pond was always kind of the runoff from their multiple acre campus. The fact that it's very large though means you're going to get a lot of water for use. The fact that it's storm water and it's in contact with what will now be considered that artificial pond will become an actual like real pond in this case. It will actually act like one, including all of the advantages and disadvantages that come with being an, an actual real pond. So where do we start looking at this? Well, I have cooling towers and I have flushing fixtures. I have a very large area. So just like in our previous example, I'm going to need to account for the parking lots in this case. You're going to see a lot of oils, emulsions. You're going to see a lot of, you know, uh, road treatment, for, this is an icy area, this actually, is in the, this actually is in a northern area of the country, so you will see quite a bit of de-ice reused. You also have large grass areas, so you're going to see a lot, you're going to see a lot lower water use from those areas because you're going to get a lot, your actual coefficient or your runoff coefficient is going to be much lower, instead of being 1 or 0.9, it's going to be like 0.5 in these cases. So you're not going to see a tremendous amount of actual captured water, but you have a very large area from which to actually play with in that case. Using it for cooling towers is going to kind of facilitate what we looked at previously. You're going to have to take this water and get it to a level that can actually be usable in a cooling tower. You do have some benefits, though. Your ground, your pond is actually going to sort of clean itself. It's going to act like a natural pond which means you're going to get a lot of settling in it. You're going to see a lot of, you know, very reduced levels in the bottom and a lot of very high oxidized levels in the top. So you're going to see a fair amount of clean water like you would see in a natural body of water kind of in that centralized area. So what do we need to do in this case? Oil and oil emulsion separation is a given. Anytime you're looking at a parking lot or any kind of stormwater application, you're going to have to do that. We have particulate removal, we're going to have sanitization, but we don't quite have as much of a need in this case for descaling. We don't quite need to look at the ROs or those kinds because you're going to be going through the pond, you're going to be going through the ground, that's going to act like a natural filter. You're going to take a lot of that contamination out at the source. So you might need to do a little bit of, of, of treatment, but it really wouldn't be much different than if you were pulling well or reservoir water in that case. You're gonna, so long as you don't transfer off of the bottom of the tank or that top layer, your centralized area of that pond, that kind of middle 70% range, is going to be very clean in that case. However, because this is an outside natural body of water, you do have the potential for Legionella buildup in that tank from a flushing fixture standpoint. So something you'd have to monitor as an engineer is do you really have the ideal conditions in your transfer loop through your building to generate more and more Legionella in that case. So a little bit different because you're kind of utilizing your environment in this case to kind of help you out because you're not using any kind of, you know, if you're using this and you're going right to a cistern tank, a big fiberglass vessel, you'd be very much like the previous example. We'd be using nano filters and ROs and we would be treating that water quite a bit. So this kind of highlights four problems that really show kind of how to bring all of these different technologies, how to really look at your situation, you know, look at what your water sources are, look at what you're using it for, and from there you kind of have to build your system around it. There are always a few givens. You're going to have to do, as I said in session two, do particle filtration, do disinfection, do identification, of the non-potable and also do pressurization. But your other scenarios, kind of what you're, kind of what you're using them for and what you're, and what you're, and what you're collecting help dictate kind of the rest of your system and kind of how you fill it out. I hope you enjoyed these three-part session on rain stormwater reclamation. We've covered everything from kind of what rainwater, stormwater, and other reclaimed water sources are through system sizing and feasibility. We've looked at rainwater, stormwater, and other reclaimed water sources to see what kind of contamination you could see, what kind of treatment systems are involved, 
as well as how to combine them to help fill out your water profile. And we looked at a few cases to show how you design these systems based on what water you're reclaiming, as well as your reclaimed water source and your reclaimed water use by looking at a few different parameters which are used to help determine the level of contamination. And we reviewed an in-depth look at the sizing for these systems on a month-by-month -month basis. Thank you very much. Again, I'm Mark Trigenti, and thank you for attending Blaker University.